<sighs> Welcome back to my garage. As always, we're working on my home-built 50cc supercharged two-stroke engine with a sliding reed valve for starting. Previous episode ended on me fixing some trouble with that sliding reed valve. This episode will start with testing of the fixing of the troubles with that sliding reed valve. And we'll go from there. My expectations are high for this week. We experienced various issues with this sliding reed valve. First it was sticking, then it wouldn't open fully, and then it wouldn't close fully. All of that should be fixed now. Opens fully, closes fully, and stays shut with spring pressure. The reason we're not using a normal reed valve, but this slide out of the way variety, is it's not needed with the supercharger when there's enough airflow from that supercharger. There isn't at low RPM. We need a reed valve for starting and low RPM operation below the power band. The reed valve is a restriction in the system. And also the reed pedals have a resonant frequency. They will oscillate and behave in all kinds of different ways, depending on shape, stiffness, and how long they are. And I would have had to redesign the cases to make something of a suitable size fit in here. So this is actually much easier and simpler and more elegant. That reed valve isn't needed. It's best to get it out of the way when it's not needed. For now that system is operated by this hand lever. Plan is to switch this out with a servo and have the ignition unit control it. This exact servo with these wire pulling attachments were actually meant for this purpose. This was back in the naturally aspirated PIP engine era and that valve was just an air valve, not a sliding reed valve. This Ignitec unit actually has means for controlling servos. There's one problem though. While fighting electromagnetic interference, I cut all these wires short. I actually mentioned I would regret that because I knew I would need some of them. And now's that time. I haven't got new pins for this connector. We'll have to de-pin, solder on new wires to the little wire stubs. Re-pin it with, the, with those. Not a huge problem though. I was going a lot of back and forth with the carb in the previous episode. Is it lean? Is it rich? It was hard to know. If you have some experience, it's usually pretty easy to hear and feel if a two-stroke is running rich or lean. It's not that easy with this though, because with a huge case volume, it's acting like it has a case leak. And also that sliding reed valve doesn't seal completely. So more case leak. And also I have very little experience with hearing if a two-stroke engine is running rich or lean at idle and low RPM when it's almost been dragged down by load from in this case the supercharger. It's just never the case. Usually you don't set idle and uh, adjust carb for low RPM off load under heavy load. We're gonna start it up and see if it's sufficiently willing to get past that hump and up into the higher rev range. If promising, we're gonna hook the retarder back up and see if it still gets past the hump. And then... We're having some problems with inconsistency here. It sometimes wants to go, sometimes not. Sometimes wants to start, sometimes wants to stall. I think it's due to the low velocity at this low RPM. And fuel is 
puddling around in the crankcase, suddenly mixing with the air, sometimes not at all. When I get it going, I can't really hold it there because there's no load on the engine. It'll just skyrocket. Impossible to get a feel for what's going on. I'm gonna hook up the chain for the retarder, see if we can still pull the engine up into the RPM range. And then we can start applying load and uh, maybe start tuning it some. Now it has to pull the retarder along too. It's not hooked up to power yet. So it's just the inertia of the retarder. I'm gonna try adding in even more timing at low RPM. We're at 30 degrees up to 8,000 now. Let's bump that up to 35. I think we can add in even more. 40 degrees at 6,000, back down to 35 at 8. Between 6 and 7,000 seems to be the place where the blower is starting to make enough flow for the reed valve not to be needed. Let's see how it behaves now. Seems to be worse. We've probably moved that pressure peak too close to top dead center, maybe even before now. Let's uh, bump it down to around 25 and see what happens. 25 degrees of ignition advance from two and a half thousand to a little bit over 9,000. Then ramping down to 15 at 13,000. Let's see how it behaves. seems much harder to control and much less willing to go now than it did last week. Up until now I've been running these aquarium heaters and they do a really bad job of heating the water. Actually didn't bring it higher than like 17 degrees and I left them on all weekend. There's something wrong with them. Luckily my sous vide heater is back in business after drying. You might remember I tripped on a cable and dunked it in the tank and it died and tripped the breaker. Well after drying it doesn't trip the breaker anymore. Let's bring the water up to about 50 degrees celsius. Then see how it behaves. While the coolant is heating up, I want to explain some stuff. The reason I'm reluctant to uh, put something like a centrifugal clutch for the supercharger drive, make the engine spin up without any drag from the supercharger, then have it engaged at higher RPM, is that mounted in the actual bike with a variator, there won't be any load except for the supercharger on the engine at low RPM. And I know without any additional load from parts of the dyno, it revs up. What we should do and probably have to is mount a clutch to the primary drive of the dyno. There is actually a clutch on there now, but it's uh, locked up intentionally. One of these uh, centrifugal scooter clutches. I could never get it to slip to high enough RPM and lock up enough after that. The problem is the primary ratio. It's a uh, 7.6 to 1, which means if I want this to grab at 7,500 engine RPM, it has to grab at a thousand RPM. They're not designed to grab at such low RPM, it seems. Hard to get them adjusted where they grab early enough, but still applies enough pressure to the bell to grab properly. I could probably get this to work, but uh, it would be much nicer with a manual clutch. Then I could also decouple the engine after a run and decouple the engine if it ceases, which uh, would be nice. And make it much easier to start. Start the engine, engage the clutch, then rev it up and uh, clutch it out like 
you would do in a bike. Also about actuating that sliding reed valve. I'm going to use a servo. The reason I'm not going to use a pneumatic valve and uh, use pressure from the intake to open it because there's not necessarily much pressure when I want to open it. Just enough flow. Pressure comes later when the pipe starts doing its magic. I've purged the system of alcohol. There's now gas in the lines and in the carb. Let's see how it behaves, just for curiosity. It was running far too well on gas when purging. I think this is our problem. Can you see the two different fluid levels there? Gas on the top and the alcohol on the bottom. And all my circuits are sucking from the bottom of the bowl. That was our first batch. Let's uh, see what's in this one. Looks like we've uh, gotten all of it out of there now. Now let's see how it behaves. Let me first check. There's still some residual alcohol in there. I don't think that explains it running this well on gas though. Like a slight bit better than on the alcohol. I think the problem is what I was talking about when I was ranting about EFI in the previous episode. How the mixture that enters the crankcase in one cycle is not what's used in that cycle. It can take many cycles until that little package of air and fuel enters the cylinder. With this huge crankcase volume, there's so much mixture just sitting there and the fuel is falling out of suspension. All that fuel is just puddling up around in the case and sometimes it enters the cylinder, sometimes not. This is really not an issue. We're not supposed to be down there in those low RPMs. We need to install a clutch so we can quickly pass over the troublesome RPM range. Get up there where there's more velocity and things are happening. I pulled the carb to inspect my sliding reed valve. It's fine. These silicone packing pieces I made though, they were really swollen. Might be this inner piece was uh, interfering with flow. And at least the swelling was maybe causing some more puddling here than uh, before. Maybe. I think I'll just ditch this fat clamp, make this shorter and uh, so this can sit flush. Should 3D print something or something else, but uh, a less fat clamp is the obvious solution. Just get the carb closer. I feel like it's running worse today than it did last week, with no changes to anything. So this might be... could explain things, maybe.
sound is bad. My main camera with the microphone is out of juice. I think I found uh, an issue now, which might help solve this. This was on gas without the retarder connected. And it manages to get past the hump and into the where it revs. The reason it's running this well on gas is that my power jet circuits they're not coming into play before there's more airflow. I tried opening the sliding reed valve and I could see fuel immediately traveling up the tubes here because there was sufficient airflow across them. And then it died every time. Now I've managed to jam the slide fully open. It's probably a needle that's uh, jumped out of its uh, tube and bumping up against the casting here. Because I've set it to the absolutely richest position possible. It seems to not be a great idea because it can jump out of the tube and... Uh, yeah. We'll need a much richer metering rod. Or grind this one. This also means that maybe it's not so much the fuel falling out of suspension in the case that's a problem. Even though I think that's a big part of the problem. Might be that the carb is just not delivering enough fuel at low airflow. I was preparing to take some measurements off my uh, metering rod, map it out and then start grinding it to get a richer profile. But first reason not to, I contacted Lectron on Instagram and uh, asked if they could uh, suggest some a range of needles, a range of metering rods that would be uh, suitable. But my current one was too lean. They suggested a range of rods and we'll ship them with the fastest possible shipping they could find. This is my first experience with Lectron carbs. And whether you like Lectron carbs or not, I think everybody can agree on that Lectron is probably one of the companies with the best customer or not really customer support, just support out there and parallel in the carb business. Really helpful and uh, really quick to reply. And I'm not affiliated with them. I paid full price for those rods and the shipping. Second reason not to start grinding this rod, look into the bore of my carb. You're getting sleepy. Look into the bore of my carb. You can see there's a smooth transition from uh, where there's no insert and into that insert in front. The rear one, on the other hand, there's no smooth transition at all. There's actually a huge step. Well, that step wasn't meant to be there at all. The only reason it's there is because I made this insert one piece for ease of installation and the gluing. After installing those inserts, I probably said something like, we need to grind out that bottom. But first, let's see how it behaves without grinding it out. See what happens. It's that compulsive, adventurous behavior coming back to bite me once again. Constant need for testing and like, what kind of a positive outcome could you possibly expect from this? A huge turbulence inducing step right in front of where fuel is supposed to be carried along by the flow. I've had this apart several times now. I'm kind of ashamed I haven't noticed and done something about this earlier. We will do now though. Now the floor is completely smooth here and no step before that hole where fuel is drawn in. Let's see how it behaves. Okay, first test with a main circuit in the carb that actually works. Let's see how it behaves. Checking spark, got spark. Let's see if the float is stuck. Float is not stuck. Well, at least it isn't now. I think it's not getting enough fuel for a cold start now. I think that uh, step in the bore created lots of turbulence and it pulled up some fuel until there was a big puddle there and then that would be brought into the engine. And that was kind of the starting enrichment. That's my theory. Let's see if some starting fluid can help us. That result strengthens my fuel puddling enrichment circuit theory. And it felt like it was behaving much less erratic than before. 
Carb is delivering a little bit less fuel now with the metering rod further down into the hole. I don't think enough to make such a difference. I think it's uh, I think we had fuel puddling behind that step before and it was delivered into the engine in chunks acting as uh, an enrichment circuit. Might actually be this engine isn't that hard to get going after all. That it's been uh, that carb step screwing with us. I need those metering rods. Should be shipped by Hyper Express today. It's midday here, but it's still six o'clock in the morning in the United States though. I've screwed it in as far as it will go now. So far that I can't actually push it in and change the position, which you're supposed to be able to do. This means we can't do full throttle because then this will come out of the hole and jam. We can test and see if this is rich enough though for uh, starting. Much better now, it's simply not getting enough fuel from that main circuit. You might have noticed how it picked up when I opened the reed valve. I think the reason for this is there's more airflow over the fuel passage. It will be really interesting to see how it behaves on gas now, while purging. There you have it, the one question no one ever asked has been answered. A huge jump before the fuel pickup point, really inefficient, seemed to not work at all actually. Who would have thought? <laughs> I was running so much better now without that step in the car. I'm ending this video here on a success. Most of my videos are tragedies, not this one. I could continue testing on gas. But with the pressures I need in the cylinder for this to make enough power to be worthwhile, I don't think I'll get away with even the most high octane leaded race fuels. We need the alcohol for cooling and keeping detonation at bay. Let's hope those metering rods arrive in a hurry. See you next time.